in the classic ecosystem science, there's this distinction between what they call R species and K species. And this means fast growing species, abilities that are species that are able to come into a new ecosystem or a new environment and really take advantage of it rapidly, like a, mat, like a weed, for example. Or then slow growing species, right? Like a tree. Right? Trees are slow growing, but they're able to bring together a very dense connection of resources and, and maximize uh, the resource exploitation from a given area. So fast growing species, these are species, they come in and they just take the easy resources. They find the easy niches, they get the topsoil, that kind of thing. And in doing so, they stabilize the conditions such that slow growing species can actually then come in over time and, uh, and, and succeed. So we're talking about two strategies here for dealing with a new ecological opportunity. And what we find then is this, in this classical ecology, classical ecology, this process of going from uh, fast growth to conservation. Now one of the more, some of the more interesting research coming out of uh, the resilience literature these days is showing that actually there's another cycle here. Right? That actually what you have in many complex systems is uh, a new opportunity, which is rapidly colonized by uh, fast movers, small fast movers usually, that then gradually sequester resources such that bigger, slower moving species can come in. And then at such a point, these become so invested in the given configuration of resources and the given configuration of species that they uh, become unable to change. So as the environment then changes around them, you have these massive uh, forests that become climax forests that then become extraordinarily vulnerable to things like disease or things like fire, an example that I showed earlier. So in nature, in balanced systems, what you then have is this process of going from this period of, of uh, minimum flexibility but maximum capital sequestration right, through a period of collapse. I imagine a forest, a fire metaphor here, that burns off all of the big trees in this period of release and releases all those nu these nutrients, all the capital here, back into the environment in such a fashion that new combinations of species and relationships can form. So you go from this uh, new opportunity, sort of entrepreneurial competition over time, this happening very slowly, getting into a climax situation where you're conserving our resources, very rapidly becoming inflexible and vulnerable to change, burning up into through a, a crisis situation and then releasing resources into an opportunity for novelty and recreation. This is where in, sort of invention occurs. And then as to, after you have, say, a thousand different alternate strategies or alternate species kind of testing themselves out here, some subset of them will establish a foothold again and the process continues. So they call this the cycle of adaptive change. And I think this is quite profound when we're thinking about strategy making for nonlinear transitions because it places us in this loop and provides strategic guidance, right? So an example, here we've got a young, uh, a newly cut forest, we've got fast moving grass coming in here. Over time, this then matures into a dense forest with lots of trees, lots of, uh, of wood, making it vulnerable to a, to a fire or collapse. It collapses very rapidly and then cycles through into an opportunity for new competition and reorganization. So, uh, going in, this type of process happens in social systems as well. Let's take the car industry, for example. Um, the very first automobiles were basically created by tinkerers in their garage, right? These guys were aficionados. They were passionate about cars. You know, at the time, nobody thought horse, horses carriage. What a stupid idea, right? You're a nerd. But by producing this in this kind of reorganization phase where they're able to test out very cheaply a variety of different strategies, Right? They found that indeed there was a purchase for this, and a variety of different, in the early days of car manufacturing, a variety of different manufacturing plants and competing companies came into play. And then over time, they all fought each other out, and it's, you know, some car companies fail, others succeeded. You know, at this time period, there was a variety of different fuel mixes and technologies and, and, and ideas for how cars should interface with society. But that all gradually stabilized. Uh, that all gradually stabilized into, in America, there is what we call the big three, so GM, Ford, and Chrysler. And these guys dominated the economy of America throughout um, the mid-late 20th century. Like up until the 70s or 80s, we had these massive corporations employing thousands and thousands of people. 
And as often happens in this cycle, they become incredibly, incredibly uh, inefficient. They become incredibly uh, uh, out of touch with the environment. And what you have then is then the quote unquote invasion of Japanese car manufacturers. Right? These guys are able to make better cars at a higher quality, cheaper, in a way that people really want. And so they rapidly cannibalize the American uh, automobile industry, which then forces this process of reorganization in the big three through traditionally the kind of macro dynamic capabilities regeneration is mergers, acquisitions, strategic partnerships, these kinds of things. And then led to the whole lean manufacturing move of um, the late 80s and 90s all the way up through now. Now what this then invention, investment in lean production and, uh, and efficient, um, uh, efficient companies produced was much closer attenuation to people, sorry, much closer, um, you much, they were much more in tune with consumer desire, right? And at the time, Americans wanted really, really big cars. So they threw all their capital into Humvees and these gigantic SUVs and that kind of thing. Which is why then, 10, 15 years later, we find them back here in this, in this period of uh, being obsolete because they've invested all of their resources in uh, something that is the SUV. Consumer practices have changed with climate change and these types of issues. And then they, in a period of two to three years, go bankrupt. And this is what we've seen in the last year with GM needing massive bailouts from the US federal government. So they're going through this process again instead. Now, an interesting alternative, just jumping ahead of it, would be, well, what would the kind of complexity approach to this bailout be? If I was Barack Obama, right, I wouldn't have just gone ahead and pumped billions and billions of dollars back into this failed industry. Right? Obviously, you want to provide some type of safety net for the people involved in these manufacturing, right? But what I would have done with the vast proportion of that dollar, those dollars would have been to spread that out into the community as in innovation grants. Right, so you spread that out to the small players here who are willing to experiment with biofuels and segways and you know personal rapid transit vehicles and all the plethora of other transport options that might succeed in the future. And then from those, see who, who can outcompete the rest, and all of a sudden you've gone through this adaptive change cycle in a healthy way. Instead, what we've done is we've actually propped this industry up again, and in doing so, we're just pushing this bar of conservation higher and higher and higher. Right? So in a way, delaying the inevitable collapse and making it much more severe once those resources run out.